Hi, everyone. Welcome to the webinar today. My name is Anne-Marie Brown, and I'm your hostess. Our guest today is a faculty member for American University's online measurement and evaluation program. She has a PhD in public and international affairs from the University of Pittsburgh and an MA in public and international affairs from California State University in Sacramento. She has more than 25 years of experience teaching, conducting research, and managing democratization and community development programs in South Africa, Zimbabwe, Sierra Leone, and Liberia, among other countries. She is a program evaluator and a specialist in the use of qualitative methods for monitoring and evaluation. She writes a blog on qualitative methods for monitoring and evaluation, and she's a regular contributor to this topic for the American Evaluation Association's 365 series. I had the honor of presenting with her at American Evaluation Association Conference two years ago. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Dr. Beverly Peters. Thanks very much, Anne. It's, it's great to be here today and to talk with you about qualitative methods, one of my favorite topics to talk about. Um, great. I'm so happy to see that you're already passionate and excited to be with us and welcome to everyone. I see persons are already filling in comments in the comment section. Thank you for doing that. If you could just continue to state where you're from, then we can get an idea of the international representation. So thank you again, everyone, for being with us. We have a little under an hour to go through various topics relating to qualitative methods in evaluations you have the opportunity to ask questions. So just post your questions in the chat box. And as I have this little informal conversation with Beverly, I can take questions from the comments box. So please feel free. Okay, Beverly, yep. thank you so much again for being here with us. And just so we're all on the same page, when we say qualitative methods, what exactly do we mean by qualitative methods? As an academic, one might look at this and talk about the difference in the epistemology and the, the, the the ethos and the, the pedagogy between qualitative and, and quantitative very different <clears throat> perspectives of the world, perspectives of what is knowledge. A quantitative approach might say that knowledge is something that is tangible, that you can see, that you can measure, you can put in a beaker and measure. A, a scientist might approach methods like that. Qualitative would tell us that we can that, that, that it, data can be subjective, it can be opinions, it can be filtered through the person that is collecting it. Different perceptions of, of what is data, what is reality, what is meaningful, then taking that qualitative side a step further and saying, well, what are the qualitative data collection techniques that we can use to add to our body of knowledge around qualitative methods. One of the things that Anne and I have talked about is that interviews dominate qualitative data collection. But as I tell my students, there's <clears throat> lots and lots of qualitative data collection tools that you put into your qualitative methods toolbox that you can pull out and use as, as appropriate. So that might be observation or participant observation it could be a range of different kinds of interviews. It's not just a, a key informant or an in-depth interview. There's lots of different kinds of interviews, focus group interviews as well, or maybe some sort of a, a participatory tool that you use in a group setting like mapping or 
uh, transect walks or a fishbone diagram. There's lots of different ways that we can engage stakeholders in, in collecting using qualitative data collection methods, really depending on the data that we need to collect to support our evaluation. Kind of a long about answering that question. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. No, but it's very insightful because you even touched upon some of the things that I, I wanted to get more explanation from as well. You touched on their various tools or various qualitative methods. Oftentimes we think focus group discussions or the interviews, but you mentioned so many others, observation and so forth. But if I would ask you, what have been some of your favorite ones to use and why? I know it depends on what the purpose of the evaluation is, but. That is exactly what I was gonna say. When we're doing an evaluation, we don't start with the methods. Mm -hmm. Probably be the, the biggest caveat that I see amongst my students and, and amongst novice evaluators, where they might say, well, I really like community mapping, so I'm gonna try to do community mapping in this project. Well, you know what? Maybe community mapping isn't gonna work for this project. Mm -hmm. so, what we need to do is, is step back before we decide what method we're going to use and figure out, well, what is the purpose of our evaluation? What kind of theory is informing our evaluation? What approach, what design is informing our evaluation? What are our evaluation questions? Mm -hmm. That you can take your qualitative methods toolbox and pull out what method is going to help you to collect the data that that you need to collect and you know what maybe that that might actually be quantitative sometimes <laughs> okay um, when i look at qualitative methods um you know interviews are useful focus groups are useful i really like using participant observation mm -hmm. it can be a little time consuming but for me being in and being part of a project, seeing how it operates, talking to people during that process, participating, gives me unparalleled insight into the project and its operations, its challenges, its successes. It really is a method that for me, when used systematically, can be a real eye opener to understanding a project and its outputs and its outcomes. Okay, well, thank you. So in sum, the method that you use when we go into our qualitative toolbox, so to speak, should be guided really by our evaluation questions or research questions, the intent, the purpose, the use, the theory that we'll be using, that should guide the method that we use rather than we say, okay, we have this method and oh, we really want to use it and then try to fit it. Yeah, and I, I think that we all get caught, you know, oftentimes we're, we're we, you know, we, we're used, we're used to using certain methods, we're comfortable using certain methods, certain methods have worked for us in the past. Mm -hmm. So we might say, you know what, I really want to do an unstructured interview here because I like unstructured interviews, I'm comfortable with unstructured interviews. You really have to be reflective about your evaluation purpose and your evaluation design and get past, you know, what your, your favorite methods are that you like to use and figure out what method is going to collect the data that, that you need to collect to support your evaluation. Which one of these methods is going to support it best? Okay, well, nicely said. But how do you explain then the overuse of interviews? Interviews are easy to do. <laughs> okay. Exception that they're easy to do. Um, you know, I think it's just something that as it, it's something that we have typically used over and over and over. It's really common. It's not as complicated to plan as a focus group. Um, it, it's you don't have to learn how to facilitate a tool. It doesn't take as long as participant observation. So I think there's a perceived ease that an interview is or, or a perceived notion that an interview is the easiest way to collect quality. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, 
perhaps it is if you're meeting with someone for an hour and getting the information that, that you need. My caveat here would be that interviews are actually harder to conduct than we think. It's very difficult to conduct a, a good interview. And my experience is that we need to triangulate our interview data with other qualitative or quantitative methods. So qualitative interviews aren't really the get in and get it quick data collection tool that we might want to think that they are. Mm -hmm. Let me take that a step further. Get it in and get it quick probably isn't the, the, the mission statement of a qualitative evaluator in any case. You know, we need to, to take our time, not too much time, but that's part of qualitative analysis is building rapport, getting to know people, having a dialogue, taking in other people's opinions, being open, being self-reflective about this, and then looking for alternative explanations, looking for alternative viewpoints. Okay. So, Beverly, based on what you just said, if... If I had a quick 10 minutes conversation with some project stakeholders, can I label it a key informant interview and say, okay, it's a methodology that I use for my evaluation? Is there, I guess my question more has to do, is there any parameters around an interview that's used for evaluation right. to make it a method versus a, a talk? A talk. Um, I like to look when I am, am conducting interviews or focus groups, I like to approach my research systematically. Mm -hmm. So that if I have an idea, if I have a, a, a semi structured format, I've got a, a list of questions that I know I need to have answered to support my evaluation. I have a structure, a semi-structured format, so I can deviate from that list according to the person's expertise. I have a way to record that data. I have a way to analyze that data. All of this then makes the interview more systematic okay. rather than just a random conversation. Important as well is your sampling strategy. So that I'm not going to a project and just interviewing the first five random people that I find. <laughs> You've got to have a strategy. All of this needs to be systematic if you're going to use it to support your evaluation. So yeah, I've been in instances where I've been on a bus or been in a taxi with someone who is a project stakeholder accidentally. Would I spend the time and introduce myself and say, hey, look, I'm evaluating this project. Would I have an interview with them? Sure. But I'd write down that data and I would, would couch it in the context in which I collected that data. Okay. All right. Well, that's great to know. I know you recently had an article published on the American Evaluation Association series that they have that spoke about sampling for qualitative methods or for your interviews and so forth. Well, some persons might think that sampling, a sampling strategy is only for quantitative yeah. methods. So what do you mean sample for an interview or for a focus group discussion? Could you explain a little bit more about the different sampling strategies that you can use for qualitative methods? So if you look at the qualitative methods literature, different authors are going to call different sampling strategies different terms so i will explain three sampling strategies that i've tended to use and i think that are common other authors other researchers might call them by different names so let me just throw that out there before i start one of the most common ways we identify informants for for key informant or for for one on one interviews would be a snowball sample where I know one person from the, the project um, from the, the community. I interview them. They recommend that I interview a second person 
and the second person recommends I interview a third person and a third person interviews recommends a fourth person and so on. So your your sample snowballs, it gets bigger and bigger. Really common way for us to approach sampling. May be some caveats to it though, because we are looking at, you tend to get people with a similar background, people that know each other. You might not get people with alternative viewpoints when we do it this way. So we need to keep that in mind if, if snowballing is, is our primary sampling method. Um, theoretical sampling grew out of the ethnography literature where you would look at a project stakeholder population and say, well, these are the different categories, if you will, of, of stakeholders within that population. So I need to make sure that I'm inter interviewing people from a, a, a range of, of all walks of life. Really a, a method that a lot of people use when they're, they're sampling. Your uh, purposeful sampling is probably the, the one that we use most often as evaluators, where you will purposefully choose people because of the role they play in a project. So the project manager or some other or stakeholder, or people that are involved at all levels of the project, you sample them purposefully because of the role they play in the project. Throughout whatever sampling technique you use for, for interviews, you just need to be cognizant that you are sampling people that would have alternative viewpoints that come out, that have different experiences, that have different roles within the project. Maybe even interviewing someone that's not a part of the project, that can be helpful sometimes as well. So you just need to be reflective of the people that, that you are interviewing so that you do survey all the opinions that are, that are out there. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, thank you for that. So we have a sampling strategy and we try to make it, um, even if it's purposeful, we try to get different viewpoints. However, if I understood you correctly, the aim not, is not necessarily representation to like in quantitative methods where you're saying, okay, this sample is representative of the general population, but it's more to get a more diversity of views. It's to get a diversity of views, but mm -hmm. there is where oftentimes we find ourselves in a situation where we're comparing qualitative and quantitative. Okay. And this is one of the, the misrepresentations or, or where we get a lot of the confusion between the methods. So a quantitative methods, their purpose, their sample size purpose, it would be to, to generalize, to quantify, to find those trends. That's great if you need that for your evaluation. Two thumbs up. But that's not the purpose of qualitative methods. Mm -hmm. Qualitative interviewing, I'm not there to find some generalization that's going to hold true for every person working on this kind of a project in every time and every place. That's just not, that's not the purpose of, of a qualitative interview. The purpose of my qualitative interview, the purpose of qualitative methods is to gather that, that rich emic data, that insider perspective. So how do you as a project stakeholder understand and conceptualize and think about this project? That's where the strength of qualitative methods are, of qualitative mm -hmm. are not in that generalizable thing. So to to complain or, or to compare or to say qualitative methods are, are weaker because they don't generalize, it's an argument that just doesn't I, it doesn't hold a lot of water with me because they just have two different purposes. Okay. You know, I can say the same thing about quantitative methods and say, well, it doesn't give me an e insider emic perspective. It doesn't give me rich data. Mm -hmm. And a qualitative methodologist will probably say, well, that's not supposed to. Well, it's the same for a qualitative. It's not supposed to. <laughs> okay, great. No, you're touching on a different issue, which is, you know, the differences or the comparisons between 
qualitative and quantitative is one better or not but um let me maybe take questions from persons who are part of this webinar so nora she would like to know about utilizing qualitative design methods tools to assess causality she would love to hear a little bit more about that right. can that be done yeah so when we look at at qualitative methods we oftentimes we'll talk about finding causal mechanisms. The language is a little bit different from finding that causation and running that statistical uh, analysis. We are looking for, for linkages. Oftentimes, one of the things that, that we do in qualitative methods is a, a process called, it's called process tracing. So you take your, your phenomenon and you process trace it back towards understanding what set of circumstances from, from B led to A. And then we can take B and we can process trace back. Think of it as a tree. So you're starting at the trunk and you're going out and you're trying to process trace and understand all these different causal mechanisms that eventually led down to the trunk of that tree. That's the process tracing that we really try to understand as qualitative researchers. Now, if you take the trunk of the tree and you go up and you see you've got a branch off, that branch we would call a critical juncture. So what critical juncture led me to go from the root of my tree up the trunk to create a branch that went in two separate ways. I've processed trace towards understanding that critical juncture. When we teach this in class, when I teach it, I recommend that students think of their, their lives because this is the easiest thing you can process trace. Where are you now? Well, I'm a, a a professor, I teach qualitative methods, I teach other evaluation classes. Where, where follow my, my tree. How did I get to qualitative methods? Well, I had an early experience working on a food security project in Zimbabwe that alerted me to the importance of qualitative methods. How did I end up in Zimbabwe? Well, I was studying international relations and I had a, a, a very dynamic professor from Kenya. And I got interested in, in African politics. My university had a link up with the University of Zimbabwe. So I ended up in Zimbabwe. You can process trace your own life. That's the same type of analysis that we often do. Now, my quantitative methods colleagues will tell you that they can create a statistical um, designs that will find causation using qualitative data. They can find ways to measure empowerment, for example, qualitatively and plug that into a quantitative design to run an analysis. Sure. The quantification of qualitative data, a little bit different than what we do when we're trying to process trace and find causal mechanisms and, and find those critical junctures. Okay, well, very interesting. I learned a little bit more about this methodology <laughs> because I was aware of uh, contribution analysis. All right, but this is very interesting. I hope, Nora, I hope that satisfied the question that you asked. And since I'm trying to get as much questions from persons who are listening in, I'm just going to roll through. Um, Gada, I hope I'm saying your name correctly. She is moving it away, or he is moving it away, she or he is moving it away from evaluations to ask about MEL frameworks. Is there any method or tools that are more effective than others to like help to develop your MEL framework? Um. I think you would probably be in a, as good a place as any to address this as, as well. And mm -hmm. I'm 
start with the purpose of the evaluation. And traditionally, a lot of our evaluations are theory focused. We find the theory of change. We put together some sort of a logic model, depending on whoever's funding the project, what, uh, what type of logic model, how they want that results framework to look. We then figure out what data we need to support that. Um, and, and we go from there. I think a lot of my colleagues are moving away from theory based theory of change based towards trying to understand or, or, or use alternative frameworks for for collecting and and um, informing our data collection processes. Um, yeah. Okay, but well, I totally agree as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a there's lots of different um, programs online that will help. I know that a lot of of my colleagues belong to different services where they can plug in their different monitoring and evaluation data, be it qualitative or quantitative, to help store. Mm -hmm. um, I really can't talk to the effectiveness or the usefulness of of those kind of tools. Yeah, I, I totally agree. And I would I would say the same thing. Um, what jumps to my mind immediately is the key informant interviews, uh, most definitely, because usually when you're developing frameworks, it, it is to serve a purpose to several users. And what has been helpful for me in the past is to ask those stakeholders who will be owning this framework, collecting data, reporting on it, exactly what are your needs? So key informant interviews, most definitely, and the theory of change approach as well. So just to concur with what Bev said as well. And I think ultimately the effectiveness of a tool really depends on what the needs are, what you, you are developing the framework for, and then you can adopt either the focus group interviews or key informant interviews um, to make that useful or worthwhile, right? Um, then we move and on. For, for one second, and I also think it's important, you know, in the 1960s, the 1970s, we probably looked at theories of change and all of the international development that we were doing was very top down. So yeah. we thought, you know, you were always the expert, the one putting together this theory of change, the one that knew how to devise the solution, the one that knew what data needed to be collected to show that you were making progress. I think we've hopefully flipped that now <laughs> so that it's not as, as top down um, so that we have active engagement of, of people at all levels so that people are empowered in helping to formulate the projects that we work on that people understand and help inform our m and &E processes in, in so that we know if we're making progress we need to I, I think we've switched and i think we need to be very cognizant of of that as well as our own role as evaluators, our own role as as outsiders. You know, I don't want to look at myself as an expert in any of this. Really, it's the project stakeholders that are the experts. Beautifully said. Thank you for that addition, Bev. Another question coming in, it goes, is it appropriate to adopt different interview strategies for different population subgroups in a single evaluation exercise to take care of sociocultural disparities in the population? I would say absolutely. Um, you know, we have different kinds of interviews. I try to look at interviews on a continuum in terms of the amount of structure and who controls the interview. So on one side of that continuum is a completely unstructured interview where you just have a conversation with someone. Really the control of interview topics would rest with the, the respondent in that case because they're telling you what they want you to know about that particular project. 
The other side of the continuum would be a completely structured interview. Your answers might be structured as well. So maybe it's more like a, an oral form of a questionnaire. In the middle is your semi-structured interview where I have you know, five or 10 questions I wanna ask, but I can tweak the language of them. I can, according to that person's expertise, I can go off on tangents. I can learn more about what that person knows. I would use the unstructured when I don't know anything about a topic or when it's super controversial. Um, you know, tell me about violence in this community. Well, I'm not accusing anybody of anything. I just want to talk about violence in the community. I'm not, I'm trying to make a controversial, difficult subject easier to talk about. The other side, that structured, I would use that when I need to collect the same data from every person to compare. Middle of the road, my favorite place to be, where I can do some unstructured, I can have a conversation, I can pull in other, other uh, data points. The uh, structured side where I can collect the same data from everyone for, for comparison. You would choose what interview made the most sense for the topic, for the data that you need to collect, for the particular informant, and, and for your evaluation, for the culture of, of where you're working as, as well. You would take all of this into account. The data you get from one kind of interview isn't more or less reliable than the data you get from another kind of interview. It's just different and you would use different types of interviews in different settings. That being said, having knowledge of the, the project organizational culture, of the place where you're doing interviews, having language skills, all of this, knowing and understanding gender relations, all of this might impact the type of interview that you decide to, to conduct, the people that you would uh, invite to interviews, whether you might do a focus group instead of an individual interview, you really need to be responsive and, and reflect um, the needs of, of the population. I'll put in a plug for Jory Halls, H-A-L-L, -L, her new book on um, culturally responsive focus groups. Um, really interesting, interesting book on how we can um, create and, and ask culturally responsive questions during focus groups. Okay, great. Thank you for that uh, recommendation, that book for us to read if we want more information on this topic. You spoke about the data that you would get from your interviews and focus group. Now a question that came in was, what are the easiest ways to analyze data collected by unstructured methods so not the common middle ground that you're talking about not the semi-structured right. <laughs> interviews right the easiest ways to analyze data that was collected by unstructured means whether from a key key informant interview or a focus group discussion for easy presentation right so you know it's it's one of the things we need to realize as qualitative researchers is that our data analysis really kind of starts when we do our first interview. We are, we tend to be very analytical people. We are curious. We're always looking for linkages and all explanations and alternative viewpoints. So in your mind, I know you're, you're, you're starting to analyze as you're doing that second interview at that third interview. I always keep a diary that has some of my ideas, you know, Anne said this, this is a topic that I need to think through some more and said that, you know, I just don't understand that. This is something that I need to ask more about. So I'm always very reflective of, of that interview process. As I am conducting more interviews, I, it sounds simple, but I, I try to become really familiar with my data. So I ask myself, who is saying what? 
And under what circumstances do people agree? Under what circumstances do people not agree? That's the, the, the first step for me in qualitative analysis. Um, taking it a step, and then look, when do people agree? When do people not agree? Why is that the case? What are the alternative explanations for what I'm seeing? And then, and it, you know, it sounds simple as well. I start by color coding my notes. So I, I do, I, I will have, you know, 25 pages of written notes in front of me and I'll color code them with, with highlighters. So that, you know, this is where this topic came up. These are the circumstances under which this topic came up. This is where people are agreeing. These are the issues that I need to ask about more. And then I, I just compare, I start to triangulate that data. Now you can do this through Microsoft Word actually has ways that you can analyze data line by line. Um, the, some people will use a program like in vivo where you can analyze text line by line. Um, uh, Bernard and Gibbs both write about qualitative data analysis, finding codes, finding and setting codes, setting themes, um, trying to, to compare and contrast and, and analyze these. But if I'm looking for the simplest way for me to do it, it's by having notes that I'm color coding with a, with a highlighter. Okay. All right. Great. Is there any software apart from Excel that's um, you could recommend. I've heard people speak about in vivo, I think it is. But are there any others? I might be updated. Yeah. I'm not up to date with current um, stuff. So, I mean, I think a lot of my colleagues these days are using Excel. A lot of colleagues are using the, the features of Microsoft Word. Um, creating taxonomies, creating charts, essentially with data in so that you can visualize and, and use it. Um, in vivo is probably the the system that most people in my circles would would use if they have enough qualitative data to be able to to plug into it. Um, you know, sometimes creating your data visualization, the whole process of just creating your data viz, <laughs> helps you to analyze it as well. Um, so if you're using is it Tableau? Um, or other, I, I know you're the data viz uh, guru here, Anne. So. <laughs> but, you know, from my perspective, a lot of times when I'm sitting down to try to visualize my data, it's another part of the analysis process. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Oh, and just a plug right here. Um, the next webinar series that I'll be having is on data visualization, where I have the data with guru, the real one. <laughs> So just for your information, guys, if you already want to keep an eye out for that webinar, it will be happen before the end of October. Okay, sorry, just had to plug that real quickly. <laughs> yeah, and you know, it's it takes time to get to know to to get to know new platforms. I know that it's, I'm seeing the chat. People are talking about um, QD Miner and DDoS and lots of different well, options. You know, I. I started with in vivo, so, you know, it's, it, it's a habit, I suppose, but it seems like QDA minor is the one that people are, are using that something, okay. uh, oh, in vivo is quite expensive. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I thought so the community, you know, thank you guys for listening and reacting. <laughs> yeah, that's great. That's great. So Mafalda hope I pronounced the name correctly, asked a very pertinent question because I believe now in a time of COVID-19 where a lot of data collection has to be done remotely. Right. The question is how do you adapt your qualitative methods for conducting research remotely? For example, without participator observation, face-to-face -face interactions. Right. Um, you know, it's it's challenging. It is challenging. I think um, having a, a baseline understanding of the project can go a long way. So if 
and having knowledge of, of the organizational culture, the projects that, and, and the context in what it's, which is operating can, can help. In my qualitative methods class that I taught over the summer, the students are meant to do observation and participant observation. They do interviews and a focus group and they use a participatory tool. So they had to do all of this online. <laughs> um, for the observation and participant observation, oh, students did content analysis of program documents. Um, mm -hmm. They did content analysis of websites they would go to different uh, meetings online that the organization had or trainings online. So one of the things we realized was how much data you can actually get from content analysis of this, these, these activities of, of documents. And that's something that we hadn't really thought about in the class in terms of, of how that could inform your your qualitative research question. Um, interviews were something that people did on on Zoom or another platform. People did their focus groups on Zoom where they would have you know four or five people in in together. I think the interesting thing was the use of participatory tools. So people doing a fishbone diagram or you know, a decision tree or, or something like that within a focus group. That works really well for the students if they had a whiteboard behind them or some sort of a whiteboard function within Zoom to, to do these, use these kind of tools or to break out rooms if they had a larger group. You know, it just took a little bit more planning than it would in a face-to-face -face setting. They also needed to make sure that they were finding ways to build rapport between people, um, being conversational, being friendly. They had to take an extra effort in getting to know people and, and building up trust because it was being done in a virtual setting and, and not face to face. So yeah, doable, make, take some creative thinking and take some time to build the rapport that, that is necessary. But we were reminded throughout this process of how much of our evaluation research is done virtually anyway. You know, we're phoning people anyway. We're, we're talking online with people through Skype or FaceTime anyway. So it's really building on what we've been doing in small amounts to make it so it's something we're we're doing more of okay all right great thank you very much i think that was very helpful um to the person who asked that most definitely there are ways to still do the qualitative methods virtually by being creative and i really like the example of having a physical whiteboard maybe behind you so you can facilitate those conversations and maybe break out rooms so thank you. And going back to the issue of purposeful sampling, Peshal wants to know what main things should we consider while sampling to minimize sampling bias? How can we make sure, be sure that our sampling is on track, even if it's purposeful sampling? Right. Um, I would you know it sounds simple but just making sure that you're talking to to everyone that is important for you to talk to <laughs> you know um so if i'm working on a microcredit project i'm talking to the different managers of that project i'm talking to the people that are taking out loans I'm talking to the people that have been successful in their loans, the people that haven't been successful in, in their loans. You know, I'm just trying to be open to all different perspectives. If I do a group of interviews and everybody agrees on every topic, I've either got a problem with my sampling or I've got a problem with my questions I'm asking. Yeah. So then I've got to write, go back and say, all right, well, am I only asking people that have the same opinions 
or does this have to do with the questions that I'm asking where I'm pushing my respondent to answer in a certain way? So the one thing that's, that's interesting, we oftentimes when we're conducting qualitative interviews, we find categories where we need to collect data around our, you know, that, that's informed by our evaluation. The qualitative methods literature tells us that what we need to do is set those categories and then saturate them with data so that our question that's related to that category is answered. And in saturation, you're not looking for everyone to agree on every point, but what you're looking for is all viewpoints within that category to be expressed. And there's been a lot of research on research <laughs> that tells us that, you know, somewhere between, depending on how you define saturation, somewhere between 10 and 40 interviews, that, that 41st interview, you tend not to get new ideas. Most ideas emerge within 10 interviews. And then somewhere between 10 and 40, depending, as I said, on how you define saturation, you're really most likely not to get new thoughts, new opinions. And so really it's a balance, right, of trying to find all of those range of opinions and saturate your categories properly so that you are looking at explanations and alternative explanation. Great, thank you so much. I think it was useful how you explain it in terms of saturation. You know, that was very good to know as well, certainly for me, right? Um, oh, quick question came in. If you know, maybe top of your head, like a, a book or resource, a link for persons who wish to know more about process tracing that you had mentioned earlier, that they can read more right. about it. Um, you know, I, um, I, I do not have, you know, the, your qualitative, you're going to have two different sets of, of, uh, of books. You're going to have your qualitative methods books, and then you're going to have your qualitative evaluation methods books. Um, you know, I draw, I was trained in, as a, in anthropology, as an ethnographer, so that ethnographic methods is how I came into using qualitative methods for mm -hmm. um, So I look at H. Russell Bernard's B-E-R-N-A-R-D. He's got a book that's yay thick, Research <laughs> in Anthropology. Um, it's probably like in its seventh or eighth edition by now, but the previous editions, like the fourth edition and the fifth edition, are available online through PDF, so you could pull those up. Those would probably have um, have some information on it and really useful um, for for us as as evaluators. Um, Graham Gibbs in his work talks a lot about different ways to to analyze data. Um, John Cresswell talks about the use of case studies. I would try to look at some of that, just the qualitative methods literature, because that's going to give you more of a, a purist look at how to use taxonomies and how to use process tracing and critical junctures um, that is a little bit different from the more applied evaluation approach. Okay, great. I'd to tape some of these or type some of these names in. Yes, and someone asked as well, is this, would a recording be shared of this webinar? Yes, the recording will be shared. And if any other resources uh, come to Bever, so I can also email that information to you as well. So don't worry, guys. <laughs> okay, uh, there was a question about like some multi, National, some organizations, USAID or CEDA, have their criteria for evaluation. Like they say, it has to be reliable and valid and rigorous. How does that fit in with qualitative data? Right. Yeah. Um, you know, you're, when you are collecting qualitative data, you need to make sure that your data collection plan 
your techniques, everything just needs to be systematic. Um, I think qualitative methods gets a little bit of a bad rap because it has been meeting somebody on the park bench and doing an interview. And that's, that's not, that's not systematic. It's easy. <laughs> or, you know, I'm on the bus for six hours and let me talk to the three people around me on the bus. It's not a real focus group. Do people do that? Did they do that? Yeah, sure. All the time. I think one of my, my mentors in getting a PhD finally admitted to me the, the one time that, oh yeah, you know, I used, I did quantitative data collection systematically, but my interviews were always just with people on park benches. I was like, oh my God. <laughs> You know, that's just, yeah. So being systematic in, in your approach. Um, you know, I think a lot of funders, and, and you can talk about this too, and really react. They, they understand interviews. They understand focus groups. Um, you know, and, and they would recognize that those can be an important part of, of an evaluation plan. Showing how it is that qualitative data adds depth to your evaluation is one way to, to approach a funder. But then looking at your evaluation reports and how it is that you report, how it is that you portray your qualitative data. What qualitative data, what does it add to your evaluation report? Thinking that through as, as well. Um, yeah, I, don't, I think you could probably address this too, Anne. <laughs> yeah, but it goes back again to when to you talk about the, the comparison between quantitative and qualitative. It's, is it a fair comparison when they all have different outcomes and different purposes? So I would think if we're talking about, well, validity, yes, we can get that from qualitative, but if you're talking about reliability and generalization, then we, we just have to state what it is that qualitative methods, really most of them are not inclined for that purpose to make statements about a broader population. And this is why a lot of times um, persons advocate for mixed methods and triangulation, right? So maybe the rel reliability part of it, that can we can get that from doing a survey or combining it with some other method, you know? So th that's my way to, to answer that question. Um, I yeah. Also reliability mm -hmm. to do with the way that we record and, and we manage our data. Yeah. And it, that's an important part of this as well, being able to explain that I recorded the interview or yes. I couldn't record because of the circumstances and it was a sensitive topic. Well. I wrote down the data as soon as possible after I conducted the interview. Yeah, and if possible, the, the raw, um, raw data, you know, the raw data is there. And manage it so that I'm not conducting 50 interviews and then sitting back and, and you know, trying to pull it all together in my head. You've got the data written somewhere. You've got transcripts. Yeah, okay. I think there were several questions that, um, touched on more or less can i speak quantitatively when reporting on qualitative information for example can i talk about frequencies yeah can i say oh 50 percent of the persons that i spoke to had this opinion for example is that a thing in qualitative methods yeah yeah, the, the quantification of qualitative data is very common. <laughs> um, it's something that uh, it speaks a lot of times to those reading our evaluation reports, being able to understand that, you know, 75 percent of the women on this project feel that they were more empowered. I would encourage you in quantifying the qualitative that you don't lose the, the rich EMA character of the data in, in doing so. What do you mean by EMA? Sorry, uh, Ben. So as an anthropologist look at data two different ways. So the, the edit perception is the perception. I'll compare this. Uh, I'll, I'll relate this to, to evaluation. The edit perception would be my perception as the evaluator going in and 
Um, and doing research on this democracy and governance program in Liberia. I'm the outsider, the perspective of, of that project. The EMIC, E-M-I-C perspective is the perspective that those people that are involved in that democracy and governance project have of the project themselves. So that, that stakeholder perspective, that insider perception. EMIC knowledge is the outsider interpretation. EDIC is the outsider interpretation. EMIC is the insider perspective. What qualitative methods tries to do is get us more in tune with the EMIC perspective so that we understand the local level perceptions, those local level realities. So some people would argue that edit data tends to be more quantitative and, and qualitative data tends to be more emic. Um, I don't know that that's necessarily the case, but the ultimate goal of, of the qualitative inquiry is understanding that, that insider, that emic analysis. Okay, all right, thank you. I see this question reposted, so let me ask it. How do I use fishbone diagram for collecting data? Um, I have, this is not one of my go-to tools. <laughs> um, I have had former students in class use the, the fishbone diagram to um, try to trace back project planning or how people see uh, the project. It's not a tool that, that I have used myself. So I don't, um, but it's, it's really to engage people towards understanding the, the roots and the consequences of, of the problem um, that the, that the evaluate that the, that the program is trying to address. Okay. Yeah. I did put something in the chat about the U.S. Peace Corps has a really good um, publication that talks about tons of different participatory tools. Um, it's called PACA, P-A-C-A. You can just Google it and you'll find it, um, but it has lots of different ideas for participatory tools that you can use. Okay, all right, thank you. We are almost at the end, but how persons were asking maybe how they can find you. you do you have any courses? Is there any way to do a course with you, get in touch with you? So uh, the best way to get in touch with me is on LinkedIn. Um, you know, I will post there when we are doing different webinars through American University. Um, we have Every semester, we do three or four webinars. Um, they're all recorded. So if you go to my LinkedIn page, you will find all of, of that information there. Whenever I publish something on the American Evaluation Association website, I always link it to, to my LinkedIn. Um, so it would, you know, they would all be there. The um, I teach at American University. We have programs. We have a master's certificate and uh, and uh, uh, badge courses in evaluation. Some people are interested in in learning more about that. You can go to the American University School of Professional and Extended Web Studies website um, to get more information there. I'll put in a plug for a webinar I am leading next week on skills for the virtual workplace. So it's not evaluation related, um, but it is on the different skills that we need to be able to succeed in the virtual workplace. So yeah, just link up with me on LinkedIn and you'll find information about all of those things there. Okay, all right. Tanya wanted to get a quick question in, um, and that is how do you determine how many persons to interview? Right. Um, you know, your end. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Some of that depends on the the. If I'm working on a project where I've got five project managers and you know fifty people that are project stakeholders, um, you know, I could probably pretty much interview about everybody there, and and not have to really sample. 
a lot of it depends on the the project itself how many people are are involved i would take this back to my comments on the saturation of categories that you're really developing your categories you are finding information to go into those categories you're making sure that you have explanations and alternative explanations and that usually by 40 interviews we're not identifying new themes um, but a lot of this is it's really going to depend on the the project itself you might not need to do that many interviews um, mm -hmm. it's really going to be on a on a case-to-case -case basis this is all related down to that systematic data collection that you need to come up with a plan that's not method driven, <laughs> but that is evaluation driven. So figure out, you know, what kind of evaluation is this going to be? And then what kind of data do I need to collect to answer my evaluation questions? When you know that, then you can figure out what methods you would use to to collect it. Okay. All right. Great. Beth, thank you so very much for your time and lending your expertise with us today. And for persons who are interested in upcoming webinars or to learn more about what I do and the services that I offer, you can always go to www.annemarybrown.com. Go on the website and you'll get all the information of when the next webinars will be and my services. Thank you so very much for joining us today and have a great morning, afternoon or evening, wherever you are. Take care. Bye-bye. Very much, Anne.